I'm here with Dr. Omer. Um, and uh, inshallah, today we will talk uh, about, uh, again, the situation of the Muslims in our political world, but also connect that to our uh, family life as we begin to understand how things uh, connect in harmony with, uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dr. Omar, my question to you is that uh, from reading your book, uh, there are, there's two, how do we balance these two viewpoints? One is that Muslims are not doing their job and therefore Allah has allowed uh, divine punishment to come upon the Muslims. You give the example of the the uh, the dictatum that uh, that Chinggis Khan gave that I'm the punishment of God uh, yes. Yes. after he had uh, conquered Baghdad. Um, so Muslims are not doing what they're supposed to do and therefore the enemies uh, are allowed to uh, reign over the Muslims. And that is a sign that we're not doing what we should be doing. Uh, and the other, way, the other way we look at it is that, you know, uh, shaitan is out there and and he's trying to cause chaos. And, uh, and, and, and in this, we have the New World Order and all the political situation. Mm. How do you balance that internal look? Okay, we're not doing, we're under divine punishment and we need to take a reality check. Mm. Mm. Versus, uh, oh, look at that, and look at that, and look, he, he's an enemy of Islam, and look at, they have this agenda. <laughs> yes. The internal and the external. Uh, is there any advice or any thought of how we can balance this? Because I really think that a lot of people that are interested in the New World Order and are aware of it still fail to look internally and are just uh, so caught up with the external. Yeah. And, and then there are other people that are so caught up with the internal that they don't care what's happening externally either. Yes. Well, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. May it please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us wisdom both to receive and to breathe out um, such knowledge in answer to your question. This is a complicated area. I will try to s reduce it to the archetypes that I comprehend and uh, with the hope that this will help others to comprehend what's taking place. You mentioned many things, uh, but uh, let me just uh, begin with the concept of the macrocosmic and the microcosmic. The microcosmic being uh, of the world that is personal, the macro being the world that is communal. And when I say communal, I'm referring particularly here to the Ummah of Muhammad. Okay. Absolutely. Now we we're aware that there are separate Ummahs, uh, da da da, and um, but we're concerned. Your specific question is what happened to the Muslims? Okay. Uh, and what I understand from your question is what happened macrocosmically and microcosmically, okay? Now, there are two mirrors here. One is the bigger one and one is the smaller one. And there's a third mirror that reaches out into the cosmos, which is the universal uh, perspective that includes all of the ummas, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll probably touch a bit on that as I try to answer this question. So let's start uh, a little bit. Let's let's start with the macro and then we'll go to, the, I mean the micro, we'll go to the macro, okay? Now, everyone is a mirror of the divine order because what you're talking about is the divine order. And I refer to this again and again and again in our conversations, and this is a principle that people still fail to understand. It's absolute. And when, when we're talking divine order, we're talking divine law. And we're not talking Sharia here, we're talking about what governs Sharia, mm -hmm. okay? 
because Sharia is based on divine law. And um, even Khaldun made it very clear. He said all divine law is for man's good. Mm-hmm. So that means at the micro level and the macro level. So if you're out of divine order, you are breaching divine law. In other words, you're stepping across the boundaries. All right. The Quran is very specific about this, and God hates those who cross the boundaries, you know, who step across the boundaries. Now, there is a boundary here between good and evil. And the with respect to divine order and divine law, and these laws, this boundary, once it's breached, what the the outcomes, the the outcomes of breaching, going over, <coughs> crossing the border without permission, okay, is uh, that these outcomes, these laws, begin to play automatically. It's not like an angel or God is sitting there and saying, oh, 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 he crossed the, he crossed the border, strike him with a lightning bolt now. No, it's not like that. It happens autonomously. It's built into the cosmos. It's built into our being. It's built into the world. And our world is interwoven with the Samawat, okay? So that what happens here reverberates throughout the Samawat autonomously okay it just that is a very interesting explanation of somehow what yes it, it's not just about uh it, it's about the the connection yes earth is connected to this heavens we're connected with the unseen and just because we don't see it doesn't mean the connection isn't there and these connections are all interwoven. So if you, you know, you, you take a sheet and you have four people stand on the corners and then you throw a ball in the center, that ball is going to affect every fiber in the sheet. Okay. And that's what we're discussing here. So that when you cross the borders, you're affecting every fi- fiber of your own connection with the Samovat. And the Samovat reverberates with this for your benefit or for your harm. Mm. It's automatic. You can't stop it. You know, the Hindus tried to describe this in terms of karma, and then Mm. they went on and developed their own theology here. But the principle is true. The principle of karma is true. Okay. Uh, The mechanisms may vary according to how you perceive it, but in any case, it's true. So, there's the microcosmic harm and there's macrocosmic harm. There's microcosmic benefit and macrocosmic benefit. And all of this is autonomous. That does, this is not to say that there is an intervention on the part of either the jinn or, <laughs> the, or the angelic realm, according to Allah's will, on your behalf. You see, it happens. Uh, but I'm talking about an autonomous set of circumstances. For example, if you're homosexual and you engage in risky sex, you're going to uh, develop STDs. Guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Okay. No doubt about it. They're, they're, they're the worst infected population on the surface of the earth, and nobody wants to talk about this. Okay. Now, I bring this example up because the Muslims are the same way, you see. Personally, they're doing all kinds of things and they are holding all kinds of opinions which are counterproductive and which counter divine law. Okay. But they refuse to look at it soberly. Okay. Because they're obsessively compulsed, uh, compulsively involved with, you know, useless ideation. Useless ideas, useless religious preoccupations that have nothing to do with anything that mm. is practical. Mm. Okay? Everybody's concerned about getting to Janaat, okay? And nobody's concerned about bringing Janaat to earth, mm. which is what the prophet did. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you understand? In, in, in a sense, because if you follow, he said, and get this clearly. He said, 
I have perfected your religion. Perfected it. That's a particular word, and I'm sure if you look it up in the, in the Arabic, you're going to find some great big reverberations that go all the way up to the throne. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah. of course. The verse of the Quran is the Rahman, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّةً And yes. the ones who fear God are given two paradises. Ah. Uh, now, some of the scholars like Imam Nathamia and many others have said, one Jannah is on earth, because you're living according to divine law. Yes. The other agenda is when you go to yes. Jannah. Yes. You know. Okay. Uh, and so this concept uh, exists within the Islamic tradition. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so we've got it. Okay. Yes. And yes. you see, I haven't studied traditionally, and I already know this. Yes. So how does that happen? Now, I don't answer the question. I just ask, I'm just putting it out there on the table. So that your religiously occupied, preoccupied, obsessive, compulsive religionist can see, hey, here's a white guy here who knows the truth. And I did not have a traditional education. I cannot speak Arabic. Okay? So, if you want to continue your path to hell, go right ahead because I have my personal Janat. I know what it is. Okay, have I made that clear? Yes. Yes. So, okay, Bismillah. So, um, okay, so, so we're not bringing heaven on earth. Yes. There's so many Muslims who go and pray. Like, I had a yes. case today at mm -hmm. one of the other mosques. This brother, I know him, he prays five times mm -hmm. a day, but mm -hmm. he's not necessarily the best um, neighbor. Uh, is not able to offer small kindnesses uh, mm -hmm. as a neighbor in, in a Muslim neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it just makes me wonder, like, how can that? I, I just don't get it. Uh, I, I get it. Oh, okay. I get it. And I'll try to explain it to you. And we're on the right track here. This is the right model. This is the right uh, archetype, you see. He is not bringing heaven on earth. He is practicing legalism, you see. And when you look in the legalist mirror, as long as everything is outwardly perfect, it's okay. That's kind of like what we do in the U.S. We make all these laws against uh, racism, but the yes. culture still has it. The more the laws, the more occupation, preoccupation with the laws, the less the spiritual essence. Okay, that is a principle. Okay, that is a very interesting. That's why now that connects with something very interesting because mm -hmm. of why the Prophet said, Don't ask too many questions <laughs> because questions would lead to legalisms, and you want to yes. keep the spirit. Yes, so you, have all, you see, I do everything, I do all the prayers, the supererogatory prayers, da 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 da. And the companion said, Go and stay with him, and then come back and talk to me. So, the man went, he stayed with this other fellow, I don't remember the names, please, but I remember the story. Yeah. And the man came back and he said, I still don't get it, why Allah would love this guy. He, sometimes he prays, he doesn't pray, he doesn't do anything extra, da 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 and uh, you know, so why does Allah love him? <laughs> why didn't you say Allah loves me? <laughs> See? And... Uh, the prophet looked at him very quietly and said, yes, I know. But what he does, he does faithfully. Mm. You see? And Allah loves faithfulness. So what we're talking about here is beyond legalism. Now, I'm not saying throw the Sharia out. I'm saying don't be don't be preoccupied with it because there's something more important. And what's more important are the two great commandments. The two great commandments is what Isa said. Mm. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. In other words, it says what did the command is. Do your best for God. Mm. All right. And you give your best to God. This is the mm. tithe. Okay. Now. And then you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Mm. 
And what did you just refer to? Your neighbor's not loving you like he loves himself, is he? Mm -hmm. See? So and when you're preoccupied with the Sharia, it interferes with your relationships with other people. And instead of developing and nurturing those relationships, you're destroying them by saying, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, do not, that, that. And before you know it, the kid's tearing his hair out, and he hates his Islam. Mm. But he won't admit it because it's too dangerous, you see. Because the Islam he's being given is not nurturing relationships. Mm. And it's not nurturing the community. It's, it's not, not Islam in its linguistic meaning. It doesn't, it doesn't have peace. There's no peace in it, you see. Yeah. So, okay, so that's at the microcosmic level, okay, of mm -hmm. divine order. The divine order, the boundaries are being uh, ignored. They're being breached. They're being um, uh, distorted, okay. <laughs> and um, this does not reflect, um, it does not reflect Asakina. Peace and security. It does mm. not bring Jana'a to earth individually. It brings a facsimile. And uh, people who are like this, they become the Pharisees and the Sadducees of Islam. Okay. And that's what we have now. You have a priestly order all throughout Islam, and they're Pharisees and they're Sadducees. And my God, if you don't speak out of, I, I, you know, I became an Alim. I didn't do it myself. Allah put me there. <laughs> okay. So here I am. I'm sitting in this, uh, this school of schools in Malaysia, the top Islamic uh, graduate school in the land. You have top academics from all over the world. They're sitting in their professor's chair, an assistant professor's chair. And I'm a research fellow. Um, suddenly dropped my parachute into their mist. Hmm. Okay. And I understand the world better than they do. Mm. But I can't speak Arabic. And I have no traditional background. And I could barely pray correctly. You understand? Mm. So this didn't make any sense in their eyes. And so what happens is you get marginalized. Oh, well, he's not an Arab and he can't speak Arabic. And, you know, after all, what does he know? That, 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 that. You know, this is an attitude which is destroying the Ummah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, we're doing it at so many levels. It, <laughs> it's not the attitude that built up the Baghdad that was destroyed. There were good elements in the Baghdad that was destroyed. And it was, the, it was at the academic level, it was not at the political level. Okay. So, um, this microcosmic uh, level is being destroyed by this attitude, by this Sadducee, by this Pharisaic attitude, okay? And it's destroying relationships. It's not building relationships out. It's destroying marriages, okay? You have husbands and wives nitpicking each other because they didn't do something according to Sharia. Well, this is nuts. It's crazy. It's psychotic, okay? And, and, you know, I, as a doctor, I can tell you that it's psychotic. It mm. borders on psychosis and it drives people mad. Okay. And further and further away from Jana'at. Well, it's Jana also, uh, isn't it kind of like uh, the Kabur, uh, pro, like uh, being arrogant? Because you're, nit you're nitpicking because you think you got it and the other person yeah. doesn't. Uh, it, uh, yeah, there's pride and arrogance there. You're no humility. You see, now I, I told you before, remember we had this little controversy and I did, I did it on purpose uh, about me drinking on video with my left hand, you see. And um, I do that on purpose sometimes just to see who the nitpickers are, to draw them out. It's a trap that I, I, I create so that I can identify who to stay away from. <laughs> you got me? It's a weapon. I use it as a weapon. And uh, because these people are, well, they're parasites. They're bloodsuckers. They, they waste energy. And the 
this energy is the energy that should be used to bring jhana to heaven, to, to earth, okay, at the macroscopic level. Okay, so... I, I, um, I need some kind of noise here. Are you getting some noise? No. No, I'm okay. No, I'm getting some kind of feedback noise here. Anyway, uh, so that's... that's the, the Oma is failing to bring Janaat to earth, okay, their portion to earth, both microscopically and macroscopically. And this is one of the major reasons we've just identified here, this Sadducee uh, Pharisaic attitude, and is one of the attitudes that Isa was constantly um, confronted with on a daily basis. And he said, look, you people use the law to keep Janaat away from your people. You do not allow your people to enter, enter Janaat on earth. So if, if your religion is perfected, and if the man who does something faithfully is loved by Allah, what the hell are you people doing to each other? Mm. Okay. I, I, I think that's and, a, and this plays at many levels, like you have the different schools of thoughts, the Hanafis, the Shafi, the Hanbali, the Salafi, the, the Malikis, and a lot of the energy is spent in trying to prove my school of thought or my, yes. this, the opinion of my school of thought is right and the other school of thought's opinion is wrong. Yes. And uh, then uh, there is also like if you're not, then that's one level. Then the other level is if you're not dressed like us, if you don't talk like us, if you don't behave like us, yes. then you know you're not fit. Uh, if you don't have the scholarship of us is also right. But each group has its own school or scholarship. Yes. Uh, like the Hanafis have their own, the others, they have their own, the Salafis have the, their own. And they're all saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm right. God. So somebody that graduates from Medina University is like, I graduated from Medina University. I have it right, right? Yes, yes. And somebody please. who graduates from Dar al Ulum is like, I got it right. Uh, I, you know, I, and, and they don't necessarily like each other very much. And, yeah. and so a lot of our time is being consumed in this uselessly it's Use a waste of energy a waste of time and i'm telling you right now that the people who hate you have organized their evil and they've organized it in such an hierarchical level according to an undivine order the exact mirror image of what should the muslim should be doing they have created a negative image of what Muslims should be doing, and this image works for evil. Mm -hmm. And at the very top, they take a look at you stupid Muslims who are running around saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, I'm holier than you are. <laughs> <laughs> look at me, I have the beard, it's red henned, and I have the turban, and I have the long robe, and I can speak Arabic, and I memorized all the hadith, Oh, look at me, look at me. And they're saying, oh, let them run with this. Because it's a waste of time. It's a way, it's really literally a waste of their time. And when they're preoccupied with that, they can't look at us. Mm. And they can't see what we are doing to them. Mm. Okay. And they will become. This is so what's happened. This is exactly what's happened. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And say, so Iblis is sitting there saying, bravo, bravo, you and, stupid And fool. so that's the external fiqh. But even yeah. when we look, even the, uh, the tariqahs many times, the, mm. the saluks, the, the Sufi groups, even they have that attitude many times. Oh, goodness me. Keep you know, them so you have that both. You have that on the people that are concentrating on Islamic law, the fiqh. But you also have that on with the people that are concentrating on supposedly themselves. Mm. But all they do is they end up trying to make themselves an elitist group of people that have secrets that no one else has. And yes, yes, this is this is counter 
this is counter. Okay, it's narcissistic behavior. The best neighbor is the one that you can trust with your welfare. And the best neighbor is the one that you can trust to help you defend your home in the time of need. The best neighbor is the one who's going to run into your house when it's on fire. Okay. And help you to, to save the seed. Okay. This is the best neighbor, not the one who goes to mosque five times a day. That's the best neighbor. Okay. That's the man whom Allah loves. Allah loves the whore. Okay. Who stops on her way home after a long night's work. To give the dog a drink out of her slipper. Now, your Pharisees and your Sadducees are forgetting these stories. And it's right. And so what I see here is that mm -hmm. even though they're in, have like, let's take the whore, the story, the story of the whore lady, right? Yes. What causes her to give water to this animal is her fitra. Yes. This is compassion. Right? This is compassion. Her, her nature is intact. Her disposition is intact, yes. or at least it expresses it itself at that time and makes mm -hmm. Allah happy. Yes. But sometimes we can be so caught up in legalisms that our fitra is not in the picture. Yes. You become so ju judgmental, you become the enemy of fitra, and you become uh, discompassionate. You lose your compassion. A good compassion. example of that would be that. Uh, there's a sister on the street that needs help. Yes. Before you were Muslim, you would run to her and say, hey, because it's fitra, right? It's mm -hmm. human nature, right. right? Like the prophet walks this old lady across the street, for example, I'm just giving mm -hmm. you an example, mm -hmm. that you see somebody in distress and you are not Muslim, but you would, because your fitra is there, you yes. would run to help her or find a way to help her. And it, it would not have anything other than, you know, helping this person. Yes. Uh, now that you became Muslim, you're like scared to go and help her because you're <laughs> afraid you're going to break some laws. Yes. Uh, and so and like, let's, like, let's talk a good about example another. that's given is is that when you're at the airport and there are sometimes sisters traveling with three kids around her and five six suitcases and and the guy is like, I I wish I could help her, but I don't know if it's appropriate. You know? <laughs> yes. Yes. This, this kind of thinking is destroying the, uh, the, the group feeling, all right, the, the group feeling uh, that is lost. Uh, I've forgotten the, the siyasa dunia. This, this is lost now. Even Khaldun identified this. It's not the same as it was with the first generation. And the uh, prophet made this clear. He said, each generation is going to get worse, and the last generation is going to be the worst of the worst. Okay, so you guys need to take a look in the mirror here, a real good, clean look. All right, get yourself naked <laughs> and take a look, good look in the mirror and see exactly what you are, you defecating creatures. Okay, and uh, stop all this pretense because that's what it is. It's pretense. Mm -hmm. You've got to get back down to the brass tacks of being human and the brass tacks of being human is being compassionate and meeting the needs of the least qualified to defend themselves. Okay. And that's, that's, that's the purpose. Now, why was the woman a whore? <laughs> because the men were not men. Hmm. They were not perfecting their religion. If they had perfected their religion, there would be no need for her to be a whore. Hmm. Right? So I don't want to hear this about the Muslim men. I mean, I, I've got all these, uh, I've, re I've read all the papers and reports about people in the Muslim countries, in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, and all their young men are running to the whores. Hmm. Almost all of them across the board. When I was in Malaysia, the young men were running across the border to the Thai whores. Mm. Okay. And my wife, because she's Thai, she knows many of these whores because some of them are her students, were mm. her students, and they still report to her. And mm. they told her, and she related to me, they said that the, their worst customers, the ones that they hated the most, were the Muslims. 
<laughs> so well, I mean, okay. So let's talk about the, that. You go home, and they become, and they they become your Pharisees and your Sadducees. They make the biggest noise, okay, about Sharia, don't they? So you know, uh, that's if I, I I want to leave this. I just wanted to make the point here, because this is not bringing Jannah up to earth. It's not, hmm. okay. So. The religion was perfected, but Muslims are not walking in this perfection. Hmm. They've rejected it. Okay. They've replaced it with something else. And one of my students is trying to find out for me when exactly this, uh, this occurred, because last time we talked, uh, we mentioned the, 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 the letter of the prophet to go through and the discussion that the prophet had with his uh, inner circle about some things which were meant to be kept there. But what is this inner circle? The inner circle is the shura. Yeah, mm -hmm. isn't it? Of course it is. And they're the ones who elect the cal caliph. Not, yeah. not the men running across the border to the whores, okay? Mm -hmm or into the back alleys to the whore so they can come home and pretend to be good Muslims and then cast their vote. Okay? These do not have a voice in who becomes caliph. Hmm. Isn't that true? Yeah, absolutely. Of course it is. So throw this democracy idea right out the window because <laughs> it's not bringing Jana to earth. Okay? Because, why? Because those people are not qualified. Okay. They don't have the credentials. They don't have the moral. Uh, 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 they don't have the moral qualifications. They don't have the intellectual qualifications. They don't have the spiritual qualifications for the shura. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, at the macro level, what's happened is that you have elected people, appointed people to the shura, who are unqualified across the board. Okay. And not only that, but the blind leading the blind. Yes, you have the blind leading the blind. And not only that, you have an element of the, the shura that has rejected natural science <laughs> for, mm. out of religious preoccupation. Yeah, mm. it, they say, oh, it's, it's, no, it's not important. And Iblis and his organized system of evil sitting there, bravo, let's fund those people. Let's give them money. Let's give, let's build them schools. <laughs> Are you getting the picture here? Yes, yes. That this is, this is what happens. And so then you have Wahhabis all over the world. They're bloody ignorant people. Yeah, come here. I'm in Japan now. You can come here and kill me. It's all right. Send me to Janat now. You bloody fools. Uh, I can say things that other people cannot say, okay? Uh, I have a license to do so. <laughs> That's right. So, so it's not just the Wahhabis, the Muslim Brotherhood's the same, the same, the same. Yeah, they're the same school. Before the Wahhabis, you had a, you had a Brotherhood, Islamic Brotherhood in, in Arabia, then you had one in Egypt. They're all the same. They're one-sided, hmm. okay? in their religious preoccupation and take that portion of the country further into ignorance with, along with them. Mm. Meanwhile, we can do whatever we want with the country. And that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you right now that you are sure us, the people who think they are qualified to be sure, they don't know their enemy. Mm. And they invite their enemy. I've seen them roll out the red carpet for the enemy of their faith. Mm. I've seen them roll out the red carpet for the people who are preventing them from bringing Jana up to earth. Mm. I've seen it with my eyes. Mm. And I pounded my, my hand on the, I pounded my fist at boardroom meetings over this matter and was thrown out. Mm. Okay. I was thrown out from my righteous anger because it's not proper adab. Mm. You know, let's uh, talk to some of the prophet's companions about that, huh? Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, goodness me. You people have lost the plot. 
All of you religious people have lost the plot. You're divorced from reality. Okay? And Iblis is sitting there going, ah, bravo, bravo. We win, we win. And then every once in a while, he sends a message to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, see, I told you they were stupid. I mm-hmm. told you they were fools. And the Jews are sitting there and say, yeah, see, we show you this, the goy, they're cattle. They'll go whichever way we want them to. Yeah. Whichever way. So, Jana is prevented at the micro and the macro level. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have I made that clear? Yes, very clear. Um, there's a verse in the Quran mm-hmm. that talks about Bani Israel, and many times we read it, oh. but we don't see that when Allah is referring to the past history, uh-huh. it's actually a warning for us now. Yes. And Allah giving the example of Allah gave the laws, don't kill each other. And this is yes. prior to this one verse I'm about to yes. talk and then Allah says, uh, and then you were told, uh, it's, it's almost like making fun of them, mm-hmm. you know, uh, We told you not to worship anyone except for Allah. And be good to your parents. Mm-hmm. And your relatives. Mm-hmm. And say good things to human beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you turned away, then continues saying, And we took a covenant from you, will not shed blood. Uh, and we took a covenant, you will not kick people out of their houses. So these are some of the commandments that were given. Yes. And then Allah says, but you went ahead and did all these things. And not only you did all these things, you would mm. take the people you would fight against, meaning internal fights amongst the mm. Jews, you would mm. take them as cap- captives and then mm. ransom them when mm. you were already told not to kick them out of their house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Allah says, uh, uh, then Allah says in this context, mm. Do you believe in some aspects of our law? And mm. reject the other aspects of our law. Mm-hmm. Whoever takes to this attitude amongst you, mm. there's no, there's no, there's no recompense other than khizyun fil hayat dunya, except for humiliation in this world. Yeah. And in the hereafter, mm. you're going to get punished anyway, even more. So yeah. uh, I say this because. I think that a lot of times Muslims feel that, okay, we have it bad in this life, but we're going to get Jannah in the next life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness me. Well, now, that's, uh, that, that's another. Uh, <laughs> and I'm contrasting that to your that's statement. That's another layer of reality there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm contrasting that to your statement that, uh, you know, we are supposed to try to bring Jannah here. Yes, yes. Versus there, but the attitude now is, well, you know, and this is for the religious group, right? The, right as a right. whole. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, we don't have Jannah here. So, you know, they have dunya here. We don't have it. So therefore, we'll get it in uh, in the hereafter. The reality is, is that uh, we've been so blindsided mm-hmm. to, to Islam, the, the beauty of Islam and what it can do. And what it would have done had we been truly faithful. Um, So, um, okay. So maybe this is a, uh, uh, is there anything else you would like to add? Well, uh, I, I, is, is it, are you getting feedback? I'm getting some kind of feedback here. I, anyway, um, yeah, this is what's happening and what you've just described is a manifestation of defeatism. This even Khaldun also. Re- uh, rec- oh, it's interesting. Dr. Iqbal says the same thing. He says one of the biggest culprits is the belief, not in the Islamic sense, but he means it in the academic sense, is yes. the belief in destiny. Uh, yes. In the sense that, oh well, you know, this is how it. it there, what can I do? Kind of attitude. Yes. Well, let's let's redefine that, okay? Because there's a difference between destiny and fate, okay? Destiny you create, okay? Mm. And you create this by uh, 
uh, you create this by a, a, a positive attitude. Uh, they keep you doing your best. Fate is what happens if you don't do your best. Hmm. And fate is what's taking over in a condition of apathy, which you just described. Hmm. Oh, well, we can't do anything now, so we'll get ours when we get to Jana. This is, this is pitiful. This is a hmm. pitiful attitude. It's defeatist, and these are the kind of people that Allah spews out of his mouth. Okay. Dr. Because, Iqbal uh, gives this example in his poetry, mm -hmm. in, in, his, in his Persian Urdu poetry, gives this example of like a bird, that if somebody's a pigeon and gets shot down to get eaten, and then there's a falcon that's way up high, uh -huh. yes. no one can eat it. And he's like, it's the fault of the pigeon for being a pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? that's that's a satanic attitude. <laughs> that's yeah, that's, that's a satanic that's attitude. And that, that's that's the predator's uh, position, yes, yes. and it's a valid position. Um, uh, but the, even the pigeon. He said this in, in criticizing the Muslim attitude of destiny. Yeah, well, this is fate. What I'm this talking, what we're, we're yeah. talking about, what you're describing is faith. This is the um, inverse uh, default, the inverse default status of uh, the divine law. In other words, when you're not doing your best and you overstep the bounds, then these laws come into play and fate overtakes you. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you stay within the law and you're doing your best, then destiny overtakes you. There's a difference. Yes. A difference, okay. One is positive. The other one is negative. Okay. Well, he's paid. It's not that, uh, it's not that, um, you know, people say, okay, well, you know, it was written. It was written. Yeah, it was written not because Allah preferred it. It was written because Allah knew what was going to happen. You understand? So Allah did not decree that these things were going to happen because that's what he willed. He decreed them because that's what the free willed person is going to accomplish or not accomplish, you see, according to their will, because of divine law, you see. Now, the specifics remain to be played out uh, of, of, of when, when fate overtakes you, whether it's an arrow to the pigeon or a bullet to the heart, it makes no difference, it's the same end. You mm. die prematurely before reaching your destiny. So fate overtakes your destiny. Fate upstages your destiny. Your destiny otherwise would have been to manifest heaven on earth. Okay. Mm. Which is what the Amish and the Mennonites are actually doing. Mm. That's what they're doing. They are bringing heaven to earth by keeping divine law. Okay. The only difference between them and the Muslim, ideally, is this thin line dealing with Jesus Christ, the mm -hmm. theological aspect. Everything else is in order, you see. The moral perspective, the spiritual perspective are in order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also uh, and part of this uh, peace uh, you know, is uh, especially from the institutionalized Islamic learning there's and what you described uh, and and what i'm coming to is kind of like this arrogance at looking at other forms of knowledge as less than islamic knowledge oh he uh, is sitting there saying yes yes let them think that let them think even that though Push allah that is idea. the one who's all knowledgeable and every all knowledge proceeds from him yes right uh yes. but because you get a certain entitlement when you know mm -hmm. certain terminologies and you can read in a certain way and you get certain certain you know there's certain benefits um whereas if you learn about the dunya mm -hmm. and it, it goes to the point that many times scholars will say don't learn dunya right no. don't learn the world but mm -hmm. that just results in shaitan attacking us yes uh and and subduing us because we don't know yes. anything about what's going on and the result yeah. is shaitan is has, has, exactly. has put our children in jeopardy. Uh, One of the very first things that the Muslims did uh, when the early Muslims is they corrected their ignorance. And during those first 300 years, 
there was this great race to not only bring religious knowledge and spiritual knowledge, but knowledge of the sciences together. And that's what they were doing in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. They were bringing this, the synthesis that creates the balanced shura. In and Islamic this is... uh, theology, there is this big debate mm -hmm. that has obsessed many, many Islamic theologians, imams, scholars, ulama, mm -hmm. which is the question of where is God? <laughs> it's considered a very important question. Uh -huh. So, like, I was in uh, Chicago, and uh, so I was going to be interviewed. Uh, by, so I was interviewed by the board of directors, and they're like, okay, yeah, we want you to be the imam. And then they said, okay, why don't we sit down with the public and the public can ask you questions. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we had a, uh, a group of brothers who were very, very concerned about what my opinion about where Allah is, was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's different opinions about how you phrase this. Is he on his throne or is he everywhere? How can he be everywhere? Is uh -huh. he in everything? You know, it's it just becomes, it's very... Yeah. So... I'm like, wait, if we, if, shouldn't we be more worried about if our next generation will be Muslim? <laughs> you know, if I answer this question, which will inevitably make one group of people happy and another group not happy, it's, it's, yes. it's set up that way, right? Because there's a group of people that say, you have to say Allah is on his throne. Mm -hmm. And then another group of people that say, no, but Allah says he's everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so this is the controversy. And, mm -hmm. and the thing is, is that uh, it's not part of our Iman to have any particular, like, uh, belief Allah is here or there as such, mm -hmm. other than Allah is transcendent, and Allah yeah. is everywhere, but He's not in everything, is mm -hmm. the way I like to, that, that's the answer I've come up with that kind of like evades a lot of the problems. Um, but anyway, that, that's not the point. The point I'm trying to say is that it was amazing for me to see how they were so, like, I have, like, the way I was asked, I have a very important question to ask. <laughs> right? So the imam's task is to know where is Allah and what will happen with the youth and what we should do with the youth and, 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 and the, the upcoming of Islam and da'wah to non-Muslims. That's like in the background. So what happens with religiosity is your priorities become upside down. You're more interested in how the prophet tied his turban. Mm hmm which yeah. is okay, it has good in it, but it doesn't have good in it if you can't do the fundamentals. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a preoccupation with the wrong mm, priority. It's a wrong priority. And this okay. is what happens with uh, becoming uh, the... Uh, not, I won't say becoming ulama, but uh, becoming ulama within... Uh, in the present day and age, mm -hmm. you come with a lot of baggage when you become ulama. Your priorities yeah. are reshaped in a way yeah. that does not fit the problems at hand at all. Yes, you are not prepared. Because we are still work. debating in our minds and in our scholarship, we're still debating with the issues that were there 500, 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. We're still debating with those issues. And we have no idea what's happening before us today. And and meanwhile, meanwhile, while you guys are debating all these issues, Iblis puts the sigil that marks his territory on top of every mosque. Yeah. The star in the crescent. Okay. The the crescent, and nobody yeah. thinks it's important, you see. But this is like Iblis, he's pissing on the mosque. Okay. That's what he's doing. Because this is a symbol of the mother goddess that goes all the way back to Dravidia mm. and Sumer and came to Babylon. And now it's sitting on every mosque in the world. And you're wondering where God is? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Iblis is going to say, see, Allah, I told you they were fools. I told you they were fools. They're praying to you under my symbol. <laughs> <laughs> what bloody idiots. I'm going to tell you this right now, ulama, all over the world, you are fools. And you have been fooled by the best, okay? Because you've been too preoccupied with the wrong priorities. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay, inshallah. This is a good place to end today. Oh, and God. we will inshallah take up from here, oh, inshallah. Okay. Should I buy extra life insurance now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I want to end uh, this session uh, with Dr. Umar today with some spiritual, uh, you can say, visualization. So, uh, Bismillah, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Uh, let's, today we focused on A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem yesterday. Uh, let us do the same today, inshallah, but with different words given by the Prophet. A'udhu bi kalimatillahi tamat min sharri ma khalaq. I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all his kalimat, with all his beautiful, with all his names, with all his commands, with all his words. We want to bring them to us as an armor against shaitan. So I seek shelter in Allah, refuge in Allah, a'udhu bi kalimatullahi with Allah's names, his his attributes, his commands. You know, Allah wa idhibtala Ibrahimu. Allah commanded Ibrahim with his word, meaning with his command. So, with Allah's command, with Allah's commands, we seek Allah's refuge. We come under his protection. So, you say that, uh, let's say to begin with uh, today, 10 times. أعوذ بكلمة الله تامة في شر ما خلق 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 I seek Allah's refuge and all his commands min sharri ma khalaq from the evil that he's created so a'udhu bi kalimatillahi ta'ma min sharri ma khalaq a'udhu bi kalimatillahi ta'ma min sharri ma khalaq